I hope everyone is having a great day. I am, uh, my name is Garrett, many of you know, and Justine is in the corner. I'm uh, looking out my window now in fairly sunny uh, suburbs outside of the Philadelphia area. What about you, Justine? I am in the Twin Cities of Minnesota and it's cloudy, but it is 50 degrees, so I will take it. That's not so bad, that's not so bad at all. So many of you do know when we start our, our YouTube social media live events. We love to know where you are logging in from around the, the country and around the world. So go ahead and and uh, as we just wait a couple minutes for people to, to log in, we have our friend Jose from Portugal who is logged in. He is our, our YouTube friend. So wherever you're logging in from around the country and around the world, let us know where you are today. If you're a vet student, what school are you currently enrolled in? Where you're logging and, and in And where from. you matched. And where you matched. We, yes, you we want to know where you matched. Hopefully uh, you match. If not, we'll, we'll talk about that in an upcoming event too. But uh, yeah, we're really excited to engage and interact and see what everyone is doing today. So we'll give, hey, Becca from Canton, Ohio. Welcome. Um, so yeah, we're going to engage and interact. We'll give everyone another minute or two to log in. To, if you're on the East Coast, maybe you uh, have a lunch break if that exists in this world. And uh, if you're on the West Coast, maybe you're waking up and like Justine, Central Time, sort of in the middle externship in Aruba. That's awesome. Take me, take me. <laughs> Can I come? Mexico City, Ohio. Oh, wow. I uh, Half an hour to your shift. Perfect timing. This will be about a half an hour session. And uh, please uh, keep that seat open in Aruba. Justine and I uh, have lectured there before. It's beautiful. I've been there before for some uh, downtime too. Salt Lake, Utah. Hey, Olivia. Thanks for joining. All right. Let's nice go ahead and get started. What do you All think? Let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm going to go ahead. And uh, so we're going to be starting with uh, how to survive your internship. And I'm going to sort of virtually pass the microphone over to Justine. We'll both be on this screen at the same time. But let's go ahead and uh, get the party started with today's session. Awesome. So you guys already know who I am, but I'm Justine. I'm an emergency critical care veterinary specialist and toxicologist and the CEO and co-founder of Vet Girl. And that is me. My name is Garrett, uh, Garrett Pactinger. I am, uh, as I said, just outside of Philadelphia, like Justine. I am a critical care specialist um, and uh, really excited to talk to everybody today. Justine and I both went through the internship and super internship, fellowship, residency type stuff. So we're very familiar and hope we can lend a little uh, mentorship and uh, advice. So I'll pass it back to Justine. All right, so we'll just do a couple of quick intro slides. For those of you guys who don't know who Vecrel is, we're actually more than just social media. We're online veterinary CE. And so if you're not already signed up for a complimentary Vecrel Elite membership, it's a 249 value uh, in US dollars. It's a great way of being able to learn. And again, totally free to veterinary students, veterinary technician students, and veterinary military. For $249 a year, which you have to pay as soon as you graduate vet school, you get over 100 hours of new CE a year. So you definitely want to check that out. For new grads, interns, and residents, we do offer a 30% discount, which is amazing. And not only are we teaching through podcasts, webinars, YouTube events, we have certificates, forums, e-newsletters, a ton of different ways to learn. So definitely check that out. Last few logistics, I do recommend that you download our podcast because you will learn from them while you're walking your dog or commuting to school. These are totally free. And most of the time I say you want to jump in e even as a first year, second year vet student, because you want to learn the lingo and understand it, even though it doesn't make sense to you yet. I promise you it's sticking in your brain. So definitely make sure to download the podcast on Spotify, Apple, whatever you're using. And we're excited because in 2019, we expanded Becco from just small animal to large animal. We have now a veterinary technician track, a leadership track, what we call cage side rounds or real life rounds. It'd be like you you and I rounding with us as a specialist if we were teaching you in vet school by the ICU cages. So those are case-based and really important. Last few logistics that I wanted to go through. We offer a certificate program. Again, this is free as a vet student. And I'm gonna say at the end of this presentation, you really need to do the basic and advanced emergency medicine ones to succeed and survive in your internship. That's our number one rule. That's why we created the certificate. So definitely make sure to check that out. You guys already follow us on social, but definitely hit that subscribe button right there on YouTube, uh, just so you can see the free ones that we have. And we are excited. This is our first year that we have inaugural vet 
girl veterinary student representatives at select schools. Uh, we'll definitely be opening up the application field again in the fall for incoming. So if you're interested, definitely reach out to us and we can send you more info on that. All right, so jumping right in. As a little bit of background, I did my undergrad at Virginia Tech, my veterinary school at Cornell, my internship at Angel in Boston, where you can see this picture of me, we were pretending to be in the Angel Penitentiary. And then I was so burnt out from working that I actually took a year off. I originally wanted to do surgical oncology as a residency, but I was so burnt out from working literally 100 hours a week plus. Uh, it was one of the busiest, hardest years of my life. Um, and I will say I was fried and burnt out by October, but by April, I could see the light. But by that point, I was so burnt out. I didn't even apply for residency. I took a year off. Um, and I will say, I do believe doing an internship is a really vital part of improving your quality of care because it gives you five years clinical experience, depending on where you practice. Now, when I did my, my internship 20 plus years ago, there were hardly any specialty clinics, hardly any 24 seven emergency clinics. And I would do my overnight worried because I'd be lying in my intern hole, our office, and be worried thinking I'm the only vet open in the greater Boston area right now. And that kind of freaked me out. So we always joke that we were gonna put these closed signs up. So we actually did during our internship uh, last week, we uh, turfed the maps to other specialty referral hospitals in the Boston area. Go to Tufts, go to North Shore <laughs> instead. So we wanted to be able to divert some of our caseload because it was so busy. Now, I will say I could not have survived my internship without my awesome intern mates. This is a picture of all 15, 16 of us jokingly taking a smoking break. None of us smoked, but we always joked, man, wouldn't it be nice just to have 15 minutes of mental health time to go outside? We didn't even get that as interns. We used to also joke that uh, whenever we needed help, we were so short staffed. And that's one of the reasons why we became so incredible at restraining an aggressive Rottweiler by ourselves while, while doing jugular vena puncture and putting an IV catheter in by ourselves. And all our staff, we were joking, were sitting there drawing up hep flushes while we were being uh, mauled and attacked as interns. So we used to say, ah, the dream would just to be to fill some hep flushes. With that, I'll pass it off to Garrett, who uh, give, will give a little back, bit of background about where he trained. Thanks, Justine. And I could echo much of uh, probably exactly the same as what Justine said. My background is just a tiny bit less diverse, although a very similar path to Justine. So I did my veterinary school at Penn, um, but as they were one of the, the meccas for critical care and still are, I really knew that's what I wanted to do when I grew up, so to speak. And so uh, I did my vet school at Penn, followed by my regular small animal rotating internship. Um, I, you know, everything, I do believe everything in life happens for a reason. I did not get the residency that year and I became the ER super intern, as they called it, you know, spandex and a cape and the whole nine yards. But I spent a year working overnight in the Penn ER, getting more clinical experience and uh, really being more comfortable with myself in veterinary medicine. And then thankfully, I did get the residency thereafter. And I stayed there and uh, finished my residency in 2010. So I was a, a Penn Wee, so to speak, from 2001 till 2010, but really learned a, a lot. And, um, you know, uh, as Justine was saying, really long hours, hard work. This is me joking. So I actually, um, we had the the uh, pleasure of going to an IVEX conference during my, my uh, internship. And it was in Arizona and it was a beautiful resort and they had a lazy river. And so I came back and I brought the mentality of the lazy river back into the penny yard. That was my inner tube floating down my, my uh, mental health break of the lazy river. And we'll get into a lot more about this, but I, this is my reminder of nobody is perfect. We're, we're going to learn a lot. Um, my reminder of, of that comes with this case. And so this was a, as Justine was talking about, being comfortable with aggressive patients. This was an incredibly aggressive dog in the hospital that ingested a toxic dose of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. We can get nowhere near the dog to place an IV catheter, but this dog was dumb enough to eat charcoal by itself and we figured well we'll just get some charcoal in then we'll sedate the dog so we can get a catheter in for diuresis and so young novice garrett decided that he was going to give some intramuscular drugs so the dog ate all of his charcoal i gave the incorrect uh uh, set of uh, IM drugs. So now not only do we have an aggressive dog, but now we had an aggressive dog that just vomited all the charcoal that we got it to eat. 
And so well, the picture is not after that I have it. Uh, thankfully, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine said it afterwards. I had four nurses basically dressed up in trash bags because they had to tackle this aggressive dog that just coated its entire cage in charcoal. So please know that you will make mistakes and that's okay. We'll talk about that coming up. But this is my reminder always that nobody is, is, is perfect and we learn a lot. Um, we also drank a lot of coffee, a lot of Red Bull. This was an intern when I was a super intern. Um, she ended up becoming a wonderful veterinarian herself, but a lot of long hours, a lot of caffeine, a lot of Red Bull, a lot of learning. Unfortunately, it wasn't the Red Bull and vodka type. It was just the Red Bull to stay up in the middle of the night after long hours and long hours and long hours. But we get to do some pretty cool stuff that, you know, I don't know the last time I was really able to treat a, a duck or a kikajou or anything else that came into the pen ER, but it was a, a rewarding experience. And I think Justine would agree that uh, while we learn a lot and it certainly is a challenge, uh, this is my reminder as well when I look at this picture, the more you put into your internship, the more you will get out of it. So um, certainly you can post just the same, but you won't get the same experience doing that. And it's not all it's not all hard work here. Some resident and intern mates of mine throwing the football around the uh, it was probably some ungodly hour, but throwing the football around the the the, uh, the uh, uh, hallways and this like Justine had photos. Uh, the, the, the connections, the friendships that you make during your internship will last a lifetime. I know that I can call an intern mate of mine up and um, even though we haven't spoken in years, potentially um, we, we always fall back on the bond that we had together and going through this process together. And these are our moments that you will certainly treasure um, for the rest of your lives. So I don't wanna make it seem like internships are bad and terrible and they're gonna work you so hard. The lifelong experiences that you make together are, are, are great. So Justine, I know I, I can start a little bit. Sure. So obviously when we think about internships and going through, there's lots of pros and cons that we think about. So obviously awesome clinical experience. I am personally somebody that sure, you need to learn in a textbook, but nothing beats seeing cases. Nothing, nothing beats that experience of getting clinical medicine under your belt. And so there'll be a time during your internship where you see a hundred of the same cases and that'll propel you for the rest of your career. So the clinical experience that you get in these cases is unmatched anywhere else. You're going to be surrounded by hopefully great mentors and specialists and other clinicians that will be able to give you sure the textbook experience. You know, this is what we learned and this is why we do it but you'll also be able to get that anecdotal experience. I always joke, one of the hardest transitions I made going from my fourth year to, to true clinical medicine, I could stand behind somebody all day long and say, you know, I would have prescribed Clavamox too, as you see it on their treatment sheet. But then you get out into the real world, you open up your textbook and the dose range is 12 and a half to 20 milligrams per kilogram. And here are the pill sizes. And this dog is an awkward weight. And how do I choose the dose and how do, you can't get that clinical experience out of a formulary or a textbook. And so you're going to be surrounded by people that are going to hopefully be able to impart that clinical and, and anecdotal judgment that will really help you form the best experiences in your career. So a great opportunity to have that clinical mojo, right? That clinical experience, that clinical flow that you're going to, it's going to help propel you for the rest of your career. I always say the first one to two years out in clinical medicine are the most formidable and, 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 and pliable years in your life. You learn how to do something the right way now, you will continue that for the rest of your career. You learn to do something the wrong way now, and you're going to take that experience with you for the rest of your life. So rely on these people, their mentorship and guidance to help you through there. If you need a residency, while there are a few exceptions, most residencies these days are competitive enough that you have to do an internship first. There are very rare cases where you can't do an internship and just propel yourself into a residency. Sometimes it can be five or 10 years of clinical experience, but an internship is the, the really the uh, common track to go from student to internship to residency. And the reality is an internship is, is one year and it can be a challenging year. But when you think about the big picture of your life, your clinical happiness, your clinical experience and judgment, it is just a very short year. And I know it seems like, wow, it's a year. That's a long period of time, 365 days, but it is just one year and it goes a lot faster than you would expect. Some cons, well, we know you're not going to make likely what a normal clinician would make. You're going to be 
Sure, you'll get benefits. You'll get a reasonable intern salary, but you're not going to be making six figures, putting it bluntly being an intern. You're, the cost of, of the internship is, is really what you're doing is you're gaining educational knowledge. It's not a financial reward. It's an educational award reward. So that's going to bring you on for the rest of your life. You're going to work hard. There's no question. And you know, if you're not working hard, then you're probably skating through and you're not getting the experience out. You should expect to work hard. I mean, there should be some balance. I get it. But this is the time to see those cases, to get that experience. And to remember, again, it's only a year. You can't go back. You know, it's really, really hard to go out five or 10 years later and be like, now I want to be an intern. You're at a different place in your life. It, it's really hard. This is the time to gain that experience and do that. The good news, you know, you're going to, this, this good and bad about your loans, right? Most of us do have loans. I'll have loans forever at this point. You know, it's, it is what it is, right? We understand that, but um, yeah, you'll have to defer your loans. Sometimes depending on how you defer them, it's interest only. Yeah. It's another year. But again, my hope is that you're a much better candidate to go out in the workforce. You're a much more productive candidate. So it'll be easier to get to garner a higher salary later, but yes, you're going to defer those loans for another year. We totally get it. Again, residencies, most of them really do require an internship. And sometimes, like myself, I did two internships, a regular small animal rotating and Justine as well, a specialty internship. And the more competitive the residencies are, ophthalmology, cardiology, neurology, it is becoming a little bit common to have a dual, dual internship, a regular sort of rotating and then a specialty one to really get that experience under your belt because of how competitive some of these residencies are. Um, quitting a program, we have that in place um, in three years. So obviously residencies, usually most residents these days are three years, if not four combined with something else. Some have a master's and a residency. Some are dual residency, four years, internal medicine, emergency. So that is a little bit of a longer commitment and you really don't want to quit a program. It's looked at fairly negatively because you've taken up a spot for somebody else. So once you go into your internship, which is great because what that does is give you some clinical time to decide, do I really want to be a surgeon? Do I really want to be a criticalist? Because as a fourth year and even a third year, fourth year, sometimes everything looks good from afar because you're not immersed in it. As you become an intern and really have a little bit more of a hands-on approach, you're like, you know, I, I don't love surgery as much as I thought I do, or I don't love cardiology as much as I thought I did. I know one of my mentors really thought she wanted to be a clinical pathologist until she got to her internship and said, no, I really don't. I don't think I want to be a clinical pathologist. And she became a criticalist. So it's a great opportunity to really assess from a more hands-on level, do I want to do that? Because you're going to do it for life. So this is something where you're going to put that time and effort in. Again, a residency also, you're not going to make a full clinical salary. I'm saying to myself, I'm going to put the effort in. So for life, I'm happy. I know me personally, my, my, uh, uh, attitude, my experience, my personality is probably the best. I could not be a general practitioner. I, I, I give all you all the credit in the world. It's a super hard job. It's not for me. Critical care is an emergency is what I fit in my life. And my internship and therefore residency helped me realize that was going to be the case. You know, your job as an intern or a resident for that matter is to learn a ton. We're not making money, right? We talked about this. We're coming in each and every day to say, I'm going to learn something. And part of it is on the floor learning, right? I'm going to learn. I'm going to see cases. And then when I go home, I am going to read about it. It's, it's challenging, but it's rewarding. Trust me, very rewarding. We're going to master a lot during our internship. Effective communication, because we know as third and fourth years, you don't get a ton of communication depending on where you train. So we're going to really get a lot of communication. You are going to learn to be efficient because it's challenging. You can't do a great job seeing 20 cases and not be efficient or else guess what? You're going to have a 24 hour shift, which nobody wants. So you will find ways and Justine and I have lectures and blogs on this on how to be an efficient veterinarian in all aspects, in all aspects of medicine, in all aspects of surgery and procedures, life-saving or otherwise, you will learn to be efficient and you will learn about them and mastering them during that internship year. You're gonna improve your patient care. You know, we get some experience as third and fourth year students in, in clinics, but it is a different approach. When you are in charge, you're not just helping somebody as the fourth year, it's your job. You're the one that has to answer to the client. You're the one that has that ownership. You want to see Fluffy do well. It's your 
you're, you have a lot of personal stake in that. You're going to improve your patient care. You're going to want to take care of them on a different level. You want to treat them. And Justine and I talk about this all the time. Treat them as if how I would take care of my pet, that's how I'm going to take care of your pet. And that means a great deal to clients. But we're going to see a massive caseload. And that's absolutely how we're going to learn. Now, this is super important. Justine and I love saying, you know, if you, if you take away just one thing from a talk, you know, what are things to focus on? No matter where you are in your career, don't be a jerk. Veterinary medicine is a small world and it is very relational. Just the other day, I got a call from a colleague that said, hey, so-and-so that you work with is applying for X, Y, and Z. You didn't write them a letter of recommendation why? Why not? Tell me about them. I guarantee any jerk can get three letters of recommendation from somebody, but we want to know what you're like to everybody else. Treat the janitor like you would treat the CEO. And if you take that perspective, no matter where you are in life, that goes a long way. So whether you're talking about the parking attendant, the nurse student, the nurse, the resident, the clinician, the diplomat, be nice to everybody. I promise you that will propel you in your career. And if you're not, that will hinder you in your career. Justine? All right. The other thing I wanted to mention is to make sure you learn one thing a day. Now, this is exhausting, even if you're on clinics right now, where you're too exhausted. Um, but I'm really going to encourage you. This is your one year that you really want to work hard during your internship because you need to make sure that you're getting a takeaway. It could even just be a formula. Don't look at Wikipedia. Actually, I like the five minute guides. It's quick. It's fast. But you really want to know the mechanism of action, the pathophys, how this drug works. So even if it's how exactly does curafate work or sucrophate work, you got to know that stuff. That's what sets you apart. That's what sets you differently from a vet tech. You know, you need to understand the mechanism of action. You need to understand that enrofloxacin, tetracyclines bind to curafate that you can't give them concurrently. So again, take the time to learn one thing a day. The other important thing that I'm going to say, and whether or not this is during your fourth year as an intern, um, uh, sorry, as a fourth year vet student or as an intern, is even though you busted your butt to get into vet school, you really need that strong work ethic. You need to put in that time and hours. There's a deterioration in this because people get burnt out. But I always say your first 12 to 24 months after you graduate are the most vital, whether or not you decide to do an internship or not. And that's because it's like what Garrett mentioned. That's where you discover all the bad habits that you're going to do. Veterinary school purposely teaches you the ivory tower because it quickly drizzles down and disseminates and gets worse as you're in private practice. And I'm not saying that badly at all, but like we do things in academia that are different and are considered ivory tower versus what happens in real life. So I want you to make sure that you're cognizant of that. My other tip is you don't go home as an intern until the resident goes home and the clinician goes home. Okay, so keep that in mind. You definitely want to play nicely. Love up your tech, that technical staff. I will tell you one of the mistakes I made as a baby intern was within my first week of graduating. Now I'm a doctor. There was a different cat that came in that was only one or two years old. And I, you know, I placed it in oxygen right away. And I said, Oh, can you uh, give it a small fluid bolus of X, Y, and Z? And the amazing technician at Angel, she just hung the fluid bag and the Buretrol on the fluid pump, but didn't actually give it to the cat. And it's because the cat was in congestive heart failure, right? The number one cause of dyspnea in cats is congestive heart failure. So she drew up the fluids, she put them right there. And later she pulled me to the side and she was like, are you sure you want to give them fluids? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> she was like, yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> so learn from your technicians. They have a wealth of knowledge. And so you really have to be humble enough, yet confident. And that's the hardest thing is trying to balance being having that humility to learn and be like, uh, no, <laughs> while having the confidence to be like, okay, yeah, yeah, I can regroup. I've got this. Um, remember, this is your one year to learn. So you want to make sure to do procedures. Some of our techs are so amazing. I don't even put in the NG tubes. The techs do it. Um, at Penn, where we were trained, the technicians do the unblocking for block cats. Yeah. Like we'd even do it. There are times where you have to be aggressive and be like, I want to do the Doppler. I want to place that IV catheter. I want to unblock this cat. 
can I do the thoracocentesis? Can I do the fast ultrasound? You almost have to push someone out of the way because they're so used to doing it where you have to be aggressive to do these procedures. It could even be a cysto. You better be really good at doing a cystocentesis, a palpating thyroid nodules, of doing venipuncture, of doing you know catheterization, and we'll talk about this later. But I'm also gonna encourage that you use the opportunities to learn. So practice when that patient is sedate or anesthetized or you just euthanized it. You know, I hate to say that, but that's your only time when you're gonna palpate and be like, okay, now there's no abdominal tone. Now I can really palpate that splenic mass. Um, now I'm gonna practice doing a bone marrow, get owner permission, obviously. But you know, these are important things to consider. All right. The next few tips that I wanted to mention, and this is something that our surgeon said to us at Cornell the day before our third year spay, our spay and neuter. And he wasn't being cocky, but he said, remember, there's nothing you can do that I can't fix. We're like, okay, okay, yeah. So if we cut a ureter, he could fix it. Okay, yeah, we got this. <laughs> and he wasn't saying it to be cocky. He truly was saying it because he wanted to give us some relief in knowing that, yep, Someone else can fix it. And trust me, as specialists, we see it all, and that's okay. I will say I made one of my gravest mistakes as an intern, and I actually went back and called my surgical professor crying at Cornell. I'm like, I totally screwed up this case. I missed X, Y, and Z. And I really appreciated his words of wisdom where he said, you know what? That's the way you're going to learn. Just don't make the same mistake again. You're going to make mistakes. You just can't beat yourself up. The biggest thing is don't make that mistake again. Now, Garrett and I are known for being type A <laughs> criticalists. We're ultra efficient. We're like, go get it done. He drinks Red Bull, I drink coffee. <laughs> um, but the reason why it's so important to learn to be efficient is because you really need to prioritize your time when you're in clinics. And here's why. When I was at Angel, we did not have a transfer service. So if you worked 5 p.m. till the overnight shift at 8 a.m., there's no, there was no transfer service to transfer the cases to internal medicine. Now I had to stop receiving at 8 a.m., work up all those cases until they went, went home, were euthanized, or needed to go to surgery, needed their ultrasound. So we'd, we'd be there for 24 hours. That's how I learned to be efficient. So I always say you need to learn to be efficient. Perfect your SOAP, your physical exam. You should do a really good physical exam within three minutes. You wanna be able to write an efficient SOAP. I don't want a two page SOAP. You don't have time for that, right? So when it comes to being efficient, it was me going into the clinic at 5 a.m. so I could SOAP all 20 to 25 cases, have the treatment sheets all fixed for the day because I knew I wasn't gonna have time to look at them for hours. I would call the owners. I always prep them. I call between 6 and 7.30 a.m. I'll call you again in the evening, and that's it. Client communication is so key, but I can't call them once I start receiving at 8 a.m. I'm already on what we call the list. So owners would be like, hello, but they knew that was the only time I was going to talk to them. So again, really important that you prioritize your time by learning to be efficient, and you work smarter, not harder. Like Garrett mentioned, we had a huge blog on this called How to Be a More Efficient Veterinarian. So I recommend that you just find it on our Vet Girl website. And I, I put this picture of me. I'm really, really pregnant here with my one son. This is when I'm just about to pop. But the reason why I put this picture here is because when I was heavily pregnant, I felt so inefficient in the clinic. I was like waddling around really slowly. I couldn't bend down. And I was complaining to one of the emergency doctors. I'm like, oh, I'm so slow and inefficient right now. And his exact words to me were, your degree of inefficiency right now is still more efficient than me on a normal day. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> So why do you need to learn to be efficient? You need to learn to go do doctor things, learn how to delegate, right? Learn to um, be as efficient as possible. Now, obviously you want that time to goof around, throw that football as Garrett did, team bond, but you really need to stop chatting so much because that's when you need to type and go and get things done. Now, especially during your internship, if you're on emergency, things will come back and be triaged curbside wise. It's brought back immediately. Well, you know what? I do my full physical exam. I'm already mentally thinking of my differentials. And even while I'm waiting for the front desk staff to type the medical record, I've already started a treatment sheet and I've already started typing my uh, physical exam findings into the electronic medical record that we're using. 
if there was any downtime, that's when I'm documenting a client communication, checking my mailbox, chugging water, eating some food, triaging email. So I hate to say it, but you almost have to be a machine where you don't have time to stand around. Now, Garrett, I'll let you take it away with a couple of key formulas that people need to know. <laughs> Absolutely. So these are some life-saving things as you get into your internship, as we know, it's not always, you don't need to know everything, but you need to know where to find things in life. There are a couple of things though you kind of really need to have a little bit more memorized or down pat. Now, when we think about fluid therapy, I mean, fluid therapy is a drug just like anything else. And a lot of what we do, especially as ER ICU people, Justine and myself, is see the sick patient in the ER that is hypovolemic and in shock and needs a bolus. And many of us work in kilograms these days. And while the entire shock bolus for a dog globally is 90 mils per kg. We never give the entire amount. We give a smaller aliquot and reassess, again, in a bubble, no heart disease, but quickly on this talk. Well, uh, what if we don't work in, in kilograms? And what if you're not used to this? And so approximately 30 mils per kg or one third of the shock dose is what we start with. But in pounds, it's very nice. You can take their pound body weight and add a zero. So if it's a 77 pound dog, Add a zero, 770 mils. So we know, if you're, especially if you're not used to seeing ER cases, you're, you're just coming out of school, your cortisol is impaired when a stressful situation comes, take a deep breath, pounds in body weight, add a zero, that is your shock bolus. I can do the math for you quickly. Again, 77 pounds is about 30 kilograms. 30 kilograms times 30 mils per kg. As I said, one third of a shock bolus, about 900 mils, 770, pretty darn close, right? Don't need to get the abacus or the calculator out. Add a zero to your pounds and that's your shock dose in a dog. So we're talking about right here. Uh, other things, blood transfusions. Pretty much any blood product you can think of. Whole blood, plasma, packed red blood cells, anything. Cryoprecipitate. If you remember 10 to 20 mils per kg of that blood products, you're in the ballpark. It's a dose range. As we joked about with Clavamox earlier, there's very rare things that have a dose, a concrete dose that you can't exceed. Most of the things that we use are dose ranges. So blood products, 10 to 20 mils per kg. DPL, a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. What that is, is sometimes when you look in the belly and there's fluid, but it's so small of an amount of fluid that using either a blind approach, which means no ultrasound or ultrasound guided, it's just too small to get. So you actually instill fluid, sort of shake, rattle, and roll the patient. Not really, but you know what I mean. And then suck it back out so you can instill 20 mils per kg to do that. And not to interrupt, but I wanted to say, if a criticalist asked you a question, I see a couple people who are matching for re internships where it's ECC busy. When in doubt, just guess 20 mils per kg, metabolic acidosis, or perfusion. And those are pretty much the right answers to a criticalist. Yeah. And if you, if, it, or I'll add lactate in there, which is basically perfusion. So if you don't answer one of those things, you weren't listening to the question at all if a criticalist asked you a question. Mills per K that causes it to kidney me in a cat. And I will actually, I'm actually going to broaden this up slightly. So there's a dose range. So as far as let's say plural effusion, let's make it easy. You need approximately 20 mils per kg of effusion to make a patient dyspneic. So let's say you have a standard five kilogram cat with plural effusion. You should be saying to yourself, when I do a chest tap, I should get out approximately 20 mils per kg. Five times 20 is 100 mils. If I only get out 20 mils, Either there's a lot left over or there's another cause for the disease. Maybe it's pulmonary edema or something else than just pleural effusion. Three to five days, five to seven days, 10 to 14 days. Depends on what we're talking about here. We know that regeneration of red blood cells, a regenerative response can be three to five days. So just remember there's always disease ranges, when to recheck, when to come back in. But remember there are a couple of important things that we should have by memory as we get into our internship because for life-saving things, we should do that. Couple of drugs, just the same, right? So we have a hypoglycemic little neonate that comes in your little kittens or puppies, one mil per kg of dextrose diluted, very easy. Diazepam or modazolam, we usually say something like one mil per 10 kg, something like that. Cat or small dog, one mil, they're having a seizure. A medium dog, two to three mils, big dog, three to five mils, about one mil per 10 kgs, 10 kilogram per body weight if they're having a seizure. For our drug doses, our CPR wheel, if there's an arrest, I have my CPR wheels hanging out right here. One side is 
atrophy and the other side epinephrine, you dial it or body weight in kilograms and it tells you if there's an arrest, how much drug to immediately give so you don't have to break out a calculator. So super easy with our CPR wheels to do that also. Procedures that you should feel comfortable with. And if you're not, this is the time to at least watch the Vecro videos, look at it up in a textbook so you know when you're ready to do it, you at least have the principles in your mind. Cystocentesis, a phlebotomy or IV catheter placement, unblocking a cat, just like Justine, I was a pen person and sometimes I would go talk to the owner in the room and by the time I came back out, the nurses had unblocked the cat. I'm like, save one for me, we need to do this. When I went out and I did my first relief shift as a, as a resident, they were like, you have to unblock this cat. I'm like, me? I have to unblock the cat? They're like, yes, you, we don't do that here. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So at least recognize the principles, thoracocentesis and abdominocentesis, life-saving procedures, the fast ultrasound. And by fast, I don't mean really quick, focused assessment with sonography or trauma. So it's a great way to have very specific angles and views in the belly or the chest for that matter, to know as non-radiologists how to look for fluid, blood or something else. GDV or gastric decompression and oral gastric tubing. So as you see on this list, these are all pretty life-saving potential procedures, not one where we want to say, I never saw this before. Remember these life-saving procedures when we get into that. And as I was saying, you know, on our platform, and you have as students access to this information 100% free if you're enrolled as a veterinary student or veterinary technician student. And again, discounts to new grads, interns, or residents. But we have a whole library of this content really clinical how-to videos, longer webinars or rounds if you want that, but it's a great way to, as you're a student, get familiar with the platform, know where the content is, so if you do need to brush up in an emergency, you know exactly where to click, you can favorite things, say, I wanna favorite this thoracocentesis video so I know how to quickly get to it when Justine's uh, heart failure cat comes in with maybe pleural effusion, right? So a great way to know exactly where it is in that emergency situation, but we can brush up on it before to at least know what the principles are in getting there. So Justine, I'll let you, you summarize and we'll take some questions if anyone has. All right, thank you for bringing it home. So I, the biggest thing is an internship is super intimidating. Going to clinics is intimidating and I hope this helps. Um, the biggest thing is focus on being a good veterinarian. I always tell our interns, there's really only two to three things I want you to learn. It's how to be a good communicator, how to learn to be an efficient veterinarian and to work hard. The rest of it will come. Don't worry about memorizing the amoxicillin clavulinic 13.75 mg per kg, the metronidazole 10 to 15 mg per kg, the meropitant 1 mg per kg. That kind of stuff you can look up quickly. You know, the most important thing is truly knowing just the emergency drugs that Garrett had talked about. The rest you have time to look up later. So that's really our success tips with surviving and excelling in an internship. You don't want to just survive. You don't want to be a crappy intern, right? You want to be a good intern because the vet world is so small. And even if you go into private practice, that's great. But I'm a huge advocate. Everyone should do that one year. <coughs> Excuse me. So take that time to excel at your internship. Hopefully this has helped. Again, I will say there are procedures I don't do every day. I don't do a bone marrow every day. And we posted a picture on Instagram that went viral. It was uh, myself and one of uh, the emergency doctors and we needed to do a bone marrow. And I was like, oh, I haven't done it for a while, but I have a video on this, I'm that girl. So we were, we were watching the video of how to do a bone marrow and we're like, okay, yeah, we got this, we can do this. <laughs> so, you know, when in doubt, you're gonna be surrounded by great people. Take this opportunity to grow wings and fly. As an intern, one of the things I don't like seeing is when interns are constantly asking people, what would you do? How should I handle this case? You're already graduated. I want you to learn how to be humble, but confident at the same time. The first time I did my tracheostomy, my intern mate was turning the pages of surgical slatter where I had gloves on. I was like, uh, you know, and it was scary. But at the same time, you have to have that confidence and you gain that confidence once you're kicked out of the nest and you're forced to fly. So you guys got this. I hope you guys found this helpful. Please make sure to you know, sign up for your complimentary membership while you can, because in a year, you're gonna be paying for it. So you might as well take advantage of it. Uh, we do have a great free how to do CPR as a vet student on April 6th, it's Tuesday. 
These are on YouTube forever, so make sure to check those out. More importantly, make sure you check with your Vet Girl student rep um, if you have one at that school or uh, you sign up at the website to get your free CPR wheel with dosing for epi and atropine. Um, so you have that in time for uh, the next YouTube. And with that, we'll close it out. We'll hang out for a couple of minutes. If you guys have any questions, please type in any feedback, um, any questions you have, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Ooh, great question uh, from Peanut Butter Sandwich. Did either of you guys do research during your internship? I will say I did not. Um, I was in a private practice one at Angel. I wasn't planning on doing a residency just yet because I was burnt out and we were too busy to. Um, but I will say Garrett and I both did the super internship, what we call the emergency fellowship or that extra year, that second internship. We did do research during that time because we knew we needed uh, something for our residency. If you are not doing a residency and you know you're not doing a residency, I'm going to say don't do research. It's not personally worth it. But if you know you want to, it's worth getting involved with the research project. But your primary goal is to be a good clinician. It's not research at this point, in my opinion. Garrett, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I completely agree. You know, the reason I, I was, as I said earlier, going into an internship, you may or may not change your mind. You may go in and say, I want to be an ophthalmologist. That's all I've ever wanted to be. And my internship is only made that feeling stronger. But I do know several people that have gone into their internship and, and change. And the, the truth is, as many of you know, seeing your fourth year and how it's progressed, it's not long and it's kind of weird and scary at the same time. It's not long after you start your internship that you're already having to think about residency applications, getting letters of recommendation. It's not, it's not like, well, I have 12 months and then I'll figure this out. It's within the first couple of months because I, I know many internships, what they'll do is they'll say, do you have an idea if, if you want to do a residency? Because what they'll do is Let's say, I, obviously, I wanted to do ECC. They made sure I at least had an ECC rotation early on in the first month or two. So I got to be immersed in it. If I needed a letter of recommendation, I was working with those clinicians because it would have been really weird if I asked letters of recommendation from a pathologist to be a criticalist. And so it's hard because you have a lot on your plate. I don't know if there's a ton of time for true like diving into research in the first couple of months. It doesn't mean as you get into your internship, six months or seven months in, the hard part is as well, um, if you're not gonna stay there, sometimes it's really hard to continue that research if it's not a very clean uh, retrospective study. So I would say focus on learning, focus on being immersed in what you think you wanna do or figuring that out. Don't go in there saying, day one, hey, who, who can I do a research project with? Like, I'm super excited. You may not be in that situation. So obviously, if it's your second or third internship, you've had a little time under your belt for that. But it's unlikely many of you will be able to start day one and say, I found a mentor, I want an internship and residency, and here's my research product uh, project. Focus on learning. It's a great year for learning. Uh, and then if it comes along later in the year, so be it. But I wouldn't make that your first priority on day one of your internship. Yeah. And then we have one more key question and then we'll uh, end it for the day and hopefully see you guys again on April 6th. So put it on your calendar. Um, how close do you have to live to your internship location? And I will say um, in general, knowing that you're going to be there 12, 14 hour days potentially, I personally think it's better to live closer so you have a shorter drive so it's safer for you to drive. Um, if you're half an hour, an hour away, you're just going to be exhausted. Um, so personally, I would say not within minutes of the clinic, um, but I, I try to keep it within 15, 20 minutes. That's my own personal recommendation because your hours are long. Um, for me during my internship, I was within walking distance um, and I would walk to the clinic at 5 a.m. Some nights I would walk home at midnight um, and it was a rough area, Boston, where you needed to adopt a pit bull to safely walk home. <laughs> so for us, our hours were relatively long and obviously use appropriate safety uh, protocols as needed, depending on where your internship is. My, uh, my regular rotating small animal internship, like Justine, it was in West Philadelphia. I was at Penn and um, I did live down the street in a sense, like, you know, a couple blocks. It was walking distance uh, because I had been at Penn for then for five years. Uh, when I did my super internship, I actually moved out to the suburbs. It was a little bit of an easier schedule as the super intern. Uh, plus, I'm a suburb person at heart. So I did move a little bit further away, but the, the commit was a little bit hourly um, or days less. Uh, but I agree with Justine for my small animal internship. I regret 
not one second being close based on the time I was there, accessibility, if I wanted to walk there to learn because the library was there, which is very easy to be close, um, especially in a city environment like Philadelphia. So I, I would also encourage for your small animal internship, knowing the hours you will be there, living close is probably beneficial if possible. And large animal internships, those are grueling also. So last thing I just wanted to bring home is I am of the philosophy that everyone should be able to, and I hate to use the word suck up, but like work through and suck up a one-year internship. A three-year residency is much harder. And, and add that on, it was four years for Garrett and I, and you guys have probably read some of my blogs before, like I struggled and battled with suicide ideation during my residency. During an internship, um, it's one year, but it goes so fast. So you really want to take advantage of it. To me, one year is uh, a really short blip in your veterinary career, but really important that you work hard on that. All right. I hope everyone enjoyed today's session. We love interacting. If you have questions, you can always reach us in our contact form. We do hope as students, you all sign up and encourage your classmates to join Vecro with free memberships. There's not many free things in life and certainly free things in life that are worth it. I would argue this is easily worth it for your clinical student career as well as as you move through. And we hope to see you on our April event for CPR. And joining and congratulations to all of you that are finishing up school or interns or residents. This is a very exciting time. A lot of work, we understand we've been through it, but uh, don't let that get you down. This is- Yeah, there, there you guys are, got this. There you are thousands it. of people that would yeah. die to be in your shoes, so to speak. They would, they would, yeah. they would, they would how many people said, I, would, I, I wanted to be a veterinarian my whole life. Enjoy, this is a great time yeah. for you and congratulations. And the last thing I wanted to leave is we do have a great but older webinar that you can check out from 2014 on should I apply for an internship or residency? That's a one hour talk. So make sure to check that one out too. Um, you can view that once you're a, an elite member, but that goes through the details of what you need to know to successfully get an internship or residency. And with that, so good seeing you guys. And if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out. Take care guys. Have a great day everyone.